The topic, protection of the nervous system, is discussed in this screencast. This topic may be found in Chapter 7 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Describe how the axons in the peripheral nervous system are protected. Describe how the following protect the central nervous system. The meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and the blood-brain barrier. In the peripheral nervous system, we do not have the protection of bone as we do in the central nervous system. The brain is surrounded by cranial bones of the skull. The spinal cord is surrounded by vertebrae of the vertebral column. In the peripheral nervous system, since we don't have bone to protect the axons, the axons are bundled together between three layers of soft, flexible, cushioning tissue into a structure that we call a nerve. This figure to the right of your screen shows the anatomy of a nerve. This is somewhat different from the figure shown in your book, but I like this one a little better. So I'm going to introduce the anatomy of the nerve using this figure, and then I'll also uh, show the figure that's in your book. So here we have an axon. An axon is surrounded by a myelin sheath. And then that myelinated axon, in turn, is surrounded by a connective tissue layer called an endoneurium. Several axons with their endoneurium are then surrounded by a second connective tissue layer called a perineurium. That perineurium bundles those axons together into what's called a fascicle and several fascicles are bundled together and surrounded by a connective tissue overcoat called an epineurium. So here we have axons bundled together by several layers of flexible cushioning connective tissue layers to help protect nerves from trauma. And this is critically important in the peripheral nervous system since we don't have the protection of bone. Here is the figure from your book illustrating the nerve. Here is an individual axon with a myelin sheath around it. That myelinated axon is then surrounded by an endoneurium. Those axons with their individual endoneuriums are then bundled together and surrounded by a perineurium forming a fascicle. And then several fascicles are bundled together and surrounded by an epineurium completing the nerve. The central nervous system is protected by the following. Bone, meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and the blood-brain barrier. I will discuss bone and meninges in this slide and discuss cerebral spinal fluid and the blood brain barrier in subsequent slides. So the figure you see here is showing a section taken from the superior most portion of the head. You can see the skin with the scalp attached. Directly below the skin and scalp we have bone. Cranial bones are flat bones, so they have a layer of spongy bone sandwiched between two layers of compact bone. And that spongy bone acts like a shock absorber, absorbing mechanical energy that otherwise might do harm to the brain. Deep to the bone, we have several layers of tissue or membranes called meninges. The dura mater is the thickest outermost meninge, deep to that we have the arachnoid mater, and then we have the pia mater. The arachnoid mater has little extensions that make contact with the pia mater, and it resembles a spider's web. Arachnia means spider-like, and that's where it gets its name. There are spaces between these meninges, most notably between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater, and this is called the subarachnoid space, and in that subarachnoid space we have blood vessels that 
provide circulation to the underlying tissue. And we also have cerebral spinal fluid filling the subarachnoid space. Let's now discuss the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is a fluid that fills and surrounds the brain and spinal cord. It circulates in the subarachnoid space, the ventricles of the brain, as well as the central canal of the spinal cord. It is similar in composition to blood plasma. In fact, it's made from blood plasma by the choroid plexus. The cerebral spinal fluid functions to form a watery cushion to protect the brain from physical harm or trauma. This figure shows the ventricles of the brain and the central canal of the spinal cord. The lateral ventricles, also called lateral horns because they look like a ram's horns, are found in the cerebrum. They contain a choroid plexus. A choroid plexus is a knot of blood vessels and ependymal cells that make cerebral spinal fluid from the blood. Cerebral spinal fluid then passes from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle. The third ventricle also has its own choroid plexus. So here we have cerebral spinal fluid from the third ventricle and the lateral ventricles mixing together. Cerebral spinal fluid then passes through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle also has its own choroid plexus. From there, some cerebral spinal fluid then passes into the central canal of the spinal cord. Only a small amount of cerebral spinal fluid actually enters the central canal. Most of it moves into the subarachnoid space and there it circulates around the entire brain as well as the spinal cord. And then finally it is returned to the blood through the sagittal sinus. Generally the rate of return of cerebral spinal fluid to the blood is equal to its rate of production. And there's quite a bit of cerebral spinal fluid produced on a daily basis. If there is some obstruction that prevents the normal return of cerebral spinal fluid to the blood, you can have a buildup of cerebral spinal fluid, which increases cerebral spinal fluid pressure, which can be very damaging to the brain. In infant and toddlers, where the bones are not completely fused, the increased cerebral spinal fluid causes the bones to be pushed apart, enlarging the skull, creating a condition which is called hydrocephalus, literally water on the brain. This does relieve some of the cerebral spinal fluid pressure, however. In adults, since the cranial bones are completely fused, they will not spread apart, and so there can be a significant increase in cerebral spinal pressure, which can cause brain damage. It is a very serious condition in adults, and typically a shunt is installed to allow excess cerebral spinal fluid to be moved from the brain into a vein of the cardiovascular system. The last feature of protection for the central nervous system that we're going to discuss is the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier consists of the least permeable capillaries of the body. The cells which make up the walls of the capillary have tight junctions between one another, and so substances cannot pass between the cells. They must pass through the cells. This excludes most water-soluble substances from leaving the blood and entering the brain and spinal cord. Water, glucose, essential amino acids, and some electrolytes pass easily by facilitated diffusion, but most other substances, many of which could potentially be harmful, are excluded. The blood-brain barrier is a bit of a double-edged sword, however, because it also makes it difficult to deliver medications to the brain and spinal cord through the blood.
While the blood-brain barrier is very effective at excluding water-soluble substances from the brain and spinal cord, it is ineffective against fat-soluble substances. So any fat-soluble molecules can pass through the blood-brain barrier. Respiratory gases, alcohol, nicotine, many anesthetics that are fat-soluble, all can, can access the brain by breaching the blood-brain barrier. Now let's review the objectives of this screencast. Describe how the axons in the peripheral nervous system are protected. Describe how the following protect the central nervous system. Meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and the blood-brain barrier.